Welcome to the SaaS Ad Lab podcast where we interview fantastic entrepreneurs, SaaS owners, and CEOs from all around the world. My name is Luis. I'm the owner and founder of Phantom Agency, a digital marketing agency specializing in scaling SaaS companies. And today we have the pleasure of interviewing Ravi. He is the founder of Push Engage. And uh, thank you for being on here today. I know it's crazy early for you. Uh, I believe it's around 5 a.m. And uh, so I really appreciate you, you know, taking the time to do this in the morning. Uh, with myself and uh, why don't you tell us a little bit more about yourself and before we get into that I do want to mention there's going to be a 15% discount code uh, it's going to be phantom 15 that anyone that's listening to the podcast or watching uh, can go ahead and put that in there and save some cash so check that out and uh, let's go ahead and, and jump into it so you know give us a little bit about your background and, and what you've been doing in the past that put you in the right position to create the company push engage all right. Thank you so much for having me. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. And yeah, uh, we have an offer especially going on for your customers and your listeners, uh, Phantom 15. So about my background, I have done a lot of things. So I'll just summarize fairly quickly. After doing a master's in computer science, I spent several years in Hewlett Packard. I was in Bay Area, uh, worked on some cutting edge technology. Post that, I decided to do an MBA, uh, went and did an MBA. Uh, switched, became a banker. I was an investment banker covering tech stocks in Wall Street at Bank awesome. of America. Uh, post that, I became a venture capitalist. I was a venture capitalist in the East Coast in Raleigh, North Carolina for several years. Again, during that time, I had a chance to actually run a um, you know company as a special scenario or a portion of you know a division I was actively managing. That got me more interested into entrepreneurship. And around six years back, when I decided to move back, I decided I would not be an investor, although I still do angel investing, but I decided I would rather learn how to build a company from scratch. And that's what I've been last six years. This is my second startup. The first one I built was a couponing startup, a consumer-based startup, a coupon site. Uh, again, and this idea came out of that. We always look for new channels and around three years back around, I would say May of 2015, we started exploring new channels to re-engage our customer. And we saw web push had just come about. We made a tool for ourselves. We saw humongous ROI. And I said, there aren't enough tools out there. So how about I kind of turn it into a SaaS product and offer it to all. And I always had this ambition of being a SaaS entrepreneur. I love the, you know, the sticky cash flow and several other characteristics, you know. So that's how this journey started. And I mean, since almost 2016, this January, since we launched, I've been working on Push Engage and uh, we've been doing well. Thank you. That's great. That's an, that's an awesome background. Uh, it looks like you, you know, spent some time in some pretty well-known um, companies kind of learn how everything works as far as the, you know, the industries and things, things like that, the startup industry, right? Well, they were a startup a while ago, Hewlett Packer. Uh, but other than that, I mean, you, it looks like you've really spent some time in a lot of really key positions that put you in the right place uh, to really take this thing on and, and focus on the things that need to be done, right? Um, obviously, <laughs> entrepreneurship is a lot different than when people think it's not, you know, uh, it's difficult and it takes, it takes, you know, a specific type of character, a specific, a specific type of person to actually be able to, to pull it off. Um, so I think that's awesome that you've been doing this for a while. It looks like you've pretty been, you've been successful so far. And with that being said, what are some of the things that have been, you know, some of the challenges that you've seen? It, it's, it seems like you've been, you know, out on the market for a while. So what are some of the key things that you've seen and, and, and kind of, you know, set you back a little bit and you had to overcome? Sure. So I, I will also begin by saying to your point, I've kind of done the journey in reverse. So most people begin by being an entrepreneur, then doing angel investing, and then being a venture capitalist. So I've kind of done the journey in reverse. And it's, it's partly because, or I would say largely because I've always followed my passion. So I have increasingly, I, I joke with my friends, I moved from a career where you were making a lot of money to making almost zero, right? Because uh -huh. Wall Street pays a lot. So and I've been only happy that I have done what my, I was passionate about. So it was truly about that is what I want to say. And having said that, the other thing which is key, even though I do angel investing as well, but for my companies, I have decided not to, you know, raise funds very early on. And so I bootstrap. So because we have bootstrap, for example, pushing it, and then I'm not saying we're not open to funds, but at initial stage, I always felt that brings in a lot more discipline. I've been very strong about that. And, and that actually in itself creates a set of, you know, whether you call it challenges or, or kind of those creativity has to be explored because so some of the things that we have seen, for example, has been a bit beyond hiring. How do you recruit the top talent 
when you're scaling so fast. So uh, pushing gauge, just to give you a quick, maybe a 30 second intro of what we do so the people have more color is we are a browser push notification platform. We have customers in over 150 countries. We are a global player. I do sit in Bangalore, India, but we have 10% of, you know, customers out of India. So it's a largely global play. We are doing over 3 billion notifications a month. Now that's a huge scale that requires, you know, uh, solid backend engineers that requires you know solid folks in security because there are folks who are attacking us all the time so the thing what i want to kind of say is that the biggest thing for us in terms of this journey has been to build a team and building a team that is you know that has been the hardest part i felt and i do feel in hindsight maybe raising money a little early on can help you with that and that's where we are now a little more open but on the other hand, it has also helped us actually uh, be more creative in our marketing approach. And my cost of acquisition is, you know, so low that I can't even tell you. I, I, there is this ratio in the SaaS world, the LTV to CAC, which is lifetime value over CAC. I did this calculation last week for a deck and I found my ratio was 8x. That means for every acquisition, I'm making 8x more revenue right away. So which means I need to maybe put in more. So the thing I'm making is the benefit we had with this approach was more around marketing efficiency, but uh, then we kind of uh, had to build our team. So that's kind of some of the early kind of struggles. Mm -hmm. So it sounds like one of the biggest things is really finding the right individuals, right? To take on the project. Yes. Um, yeah. Obviously it's, it's, it's difficult. And this is something that came up in a different podcast also. And in, in the fact that a lot of the people that are in the same space, right. That are interested in startups and things like that. I feel like a lot of them, they go into it and, and, their mentality is to learn how things are being done and then, you know, um, detach to create their own product um, or mm -hmm. something like that. So they, they kind of sit through, you know, the essentials and they learn how to, how things work and how everything's being done. Uh, and then they, they go off and do their own thing. And this is similar with a lot of big companies too. For example, you have Tesla, right? And then you see that all these key players in Tesla start leaving to create their new, pretty much a competitor. Um, and you see it in a lot of different places. So I think that it's something very important. It's fine. It's finding the talent, but not only that, because there's many people that can, that can take care of the, the, you know, the, the problems and the engineering and things like that, but it's finding people that are loyal to the company. Yeah. So I think that's extremely important. That's a good point for anyone that is in the position right now where they're finding that they need to bring on more, more candidates and more people. Uh, just make sure that you have, you know, the, the right characteristics of someone that is loyal someone that is, you know, has the same values as yourself and really the same vision that's going to help you get there. And not only that, but also stay with you through the long run. Um, so I think yeah. that's really important. And now I, I want to talk a little bit more about the product and, uh, you know, some of the things that you've maybe had to pivot or change along the way. So essentially when you first started, um, did you know who your target audience was going to be or did you kind of go th for everything and then start niching down or is it still just pretty much if they find you and they think it's, it's a valuable product, can they acquire, you know, the, the service? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So, so, and I know this from my experience of both investing and seeing so many startups, see the product market fit is a huge question. Uh, fortunately for some of the products like ours, where it's a little bit of a horizontal, you clearly know it's an email marketing software, uh, or it's a web push notification. So your need is clearly established. The so problem you're solving is easy. Then it comes to the second question, which is who's your target audience? So when we started, we definitely did not know who our target audience mm -hmm. was. Uh, we thought it could be e-commerce, it could be media sites, it could be SaaS, it could be some other vertical. But over time, of course, we discovered who were using it the most and they were these only. I mean, they were e-commerce sites who benefit a lot from re-engagement. They had this issue around, they were uh, getting a very costly acquisition, the first acquisition, and they wanted to increase the efficiency of the click that they were bringing in. Let's say I'm paying $5 to get this click. Now, if I can retarget using some other method, uh, and again, I don't want to pay Facebook for the retargeting. I, I right. could do retargeting using push in a much cheaper way. Now, that's something that was appealing to them. And of course, media companies, because they're always looking for getting more traffic, they were getting, you know, uh, uh, and they were having issues because of the ad blocks and etc and so they were suffering because of that their ability to spend is limited so those two segments kind of over time evolved but from a product perspective i guess uh, we haven't had to pivot 
but then we have kind of uh, now knowing our audience or let's say after a year we kind of recognize who our audience is and then more than that there is also a segmentation then when you say e-commerce are you going after the large e-commerce you know like the walmart or or, uh-huh. or you know the flipkart in india or are you going after mid so that's kind of i guess the next level which over time we realize based on our pricing and other factors who we wanted to target and then build a product which has more ingrained for them for example if you're selling to a super large enterprise you may not so much care about a do-it-yourself product because more often than not you have customer success folks uh, walking them uh, to go on live and there is maybe a five day or 10 day integration process uh-huh. with that although if you came on my site you can go live in five minutes and that's a complete do-it-yourself so so we kind of recognize our segment and build a product towards it but uh, but finding the target i guess uh, was pretty quick for us in terms of knowing who our audience was but the segment within them that's something which took a while for us to figure out okay is that because of because of the the scaling was scaling for you was that pretty easy to do since it was you know a, a pretty unique product that there wasn't many out there yeah no so scaling uh, so scaling in terms of handling uh, volume uh, wasn't very easy is what I'll say so we ended up actually doing at least two rewrites of our application and any rewrite is a pretty expensive you know operation so uh, we we started seeing so when we put this together fairly quickly uh, we hadn't probably planned for humanga scale but then as we grew we knew we had to do something about it and that's when we rewrote so that's where the scale part came and i think that helped us and once we had rewritten the application this happened maybe two years back and relaunched it then we knew we were ready to kind of take on growth and and that actually that's something that has helped us because i do know there are many players in the industry but when people go out and try out any other person who has let's say a web push product most people have fundamental challenges in scaling and their product is often very buggy and that's because it's easy to build a product but building a stable product building something that can meet your need is is often non trivial and something that's kind of we are proud of Mm-hmm. and the other thing i must ab- absolutely add is that do it yourself nature see given the fact that i am selling to customers who are 90% outside my time zone means that the customers should find it so intuitive that they can quickly try out the product and kind of and and, and that goes without saying for saas but having said that i have still seen or we still see so many product that are not built with that so so that's something that we had from day one although i still mm-hmm. think that we can do a lot more lot better but still since we are not targeting absolutely the low end i guess we are still fine we are looking for folks who are at least uh, those who are maybe a programmer who is installing or, or so so we, we are very well for that even for bloggers we have single plugins but that's something that we kind of uh, work on a lot which is how do you make the user experience such mm-hmm. that that anybody who is not aware comes online can quickly go live and that's a big thing for us. Yeah, and that's that's a big thing too when when you have, you know, pretty much that anyone can go and create an e-commerce site or something like that because of Shopify, you have to make sure that you make these types of things uh very sure. user friendly because essentially they're used to, you know, dragging and dropping whatever and things like that and and they can have pretty successful, you know, e-com sites and stuff like that by just going through Shopify and using templates. Um, yep. but that doesn't mean that they have all this other knowledge on, you know, how to do very technical things. So yep. making it, you know, it, it has to go hand in hand. So if you want to go after those same people, you have to make sure that the product is something that's going to be not only, you know, attainable at a price, but also from a knowledge perspective and how intuitive it is. Um, yep. so I think that's important that you mentioned that. And, and it's definitely, you know, a thing that I've seen before too, where, uh they just make the product way too hard to to really uh, understand and and use and things like that and it's sometimes things that not even um like a demo can fix um and so i think it's important to make sure you know that that you have the right approach to a uh, user experience and things like that so that's definitely important and uh, <clears throat> another question that i wanted to ask is how do you figure out or how did you figure out you know what kind of pricing structure you wanted to go with Yeah so i think that's a big one i i still don't think we have kind of figured that one out as uh-huh. well i'll say uh, so so the the way we look at pricing uh, so far has been i guess uh, what we call as a cost base uh looking at our cost and looking at that or looking at maybe what's uh, prevalent in the market 
Um, and But we are slowly moving to what is called the value-based pricing, which means now we're trying to recognize, okay, if using this product, how much value is getting created for the e-commerce store and, mm-hmm. and kind of base our pricing. So to be honest, our pricing still does not reflect that we are probably a laggard when it comes to pricing changes. We're probably not been that aggressive, but it's also a function of the industry dynamics. We have one player in the industry which is giving everything away for free and they've raised venture funds. So that's part of the issue why when we have pricing debates, we have that, hey, we have one one vendor who is just giving everything for free, although they actually sell your cookie data, but then most most people don't care about that. They just see the free tag. And so the point I'm making is that that's kind of partly the reason, but that's not to, uh, but but slowly we are moving towards value-based because this is where we realize that we are much better aligned than we are measuring exactly what value I bring to the e-commerce store, how much extra revenue I draw. And then if I take a percentage in some sense or the price reflects that, then that's probably the optimal for all of us. There, is there a way, and I'm not entirely sure on how you know some, some of the product works essentially, but if, if it's a very focused on e-com sites, are, are, are people that are using the product able to give attribution to specific notifications? For example, like yeah. you, you can do things like that on Facebook ads, right? Where you see, well, there's a sale obviously happened because of this. Is it something that people can also do? So for example, well, having, you know, without this, you would have had 3% ROAS or return ad spent. Um, but without it, you would have, or with it, you had eight or, you know, whatever the number sure. might be. Is that yeah, something and, that you can see? Yeah, absolutely. See, what happens is, so our platform, you get subscribers and then you send notifications, right? These notifications could be of two types. One could be just a general blast or, or a flash sale. The other we do is the special targeted, like an abandoned cart. Now, in the abandoned cart, in my dashboard itself, you can see how many conversions we got you. And so, because we we have that ability to track, so there also I can show you the revenue that I got, the lift I got. Wow. And then for others, we do have the UTM variable, so you can easily see so what we are now trying to do is to tie it and see, bring it in my dashboard because sometimes you as an e-commerce person may not do that analysis. You may not see uh-huh. hey, how much is this channel bringing for me because there may be some different campaign IDs or whatever. So now we are trying to see what I can do in my dashboard to show you the extra revenue we got as a channel. Mm-hmm. And bring uh, uh, maybe a premium pricing because some of the features that we have like abandoned cart actually get you a lot of revenue. Uh-huh. So, that's awesome. That's awesome. And uh, I definitely like that, you know, coming from an advertising perspective and always looking for different ways to give attribution to different things and things like that. I think that's fascinating uh, whenever you're able to, to give credit where it's due, right? And essentially, yeah. that's where you're talking about more value-based pricing and things like that. Now, let's get a little bit more into a personal level. And uh, essentially, what, are, what would you say is one of the things that, that you are not so good at? Oh, that's a, that's a, that's a tough one. I mean, I, I was going to begin by let's say what all I can do. So I, I was a technology person. I used to write code uh, back in the day. I've actually written a book also. I was in standard body. So that was old. Then six years I did, you know, just management or, or I wouldn't say management finance. Um, and, and marketing. And then I've become technology person again. In fact, I just posted on my Facebook wall a few days back that I just did the advanced architect from AWS. And that's because the company needs it. And I realized that I'm still a good techie. So I can do technical roles. Uh-huh. I actually have done digital marketing for a long while. I spoke on growth hacking for several years. Awesome. In fact, I've done maybe 50 stocks on that. So there are some hacks that we discovered uh, and I'm happy to share some if you want. And so I've been a marketer as well. And then um, I guess uh, because I was in finance, I've done many m and deals as, a venture, as part of the being a venture fund. Mm-hmm. I've seen several m and transactions and then built and sold company as an angel also we exited. So I have three hats I have kind of put on. So that way I think I'm, I know probably too much and that's probably my weakness. Maybe is that I kind of, um, I mean, uh, or I'm kind of aware of everything uh-huh. rather than maybe specializing. I don't know. I mean, that's kind of what I feel. Uh, so that has really helped sometimes when you're lean that you can play. Oh, definitely. I, I feel like that can, you know, it's, it's something that especially, and this might not be the case with you, right? Because you have like a whole team in the back end with, with yourself, like your company's pretty, you know, advanced when it comes to actual growth and things like that. And the amount of time that you've been around, but essentially when, when you have like a, a startup with just one, two team members and, uh, 
you know, each one of them, it might, might, it might not even be the case that they want to do everything, but they have to, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. It, it's just, no, I think now to. I'm at a stage. Yeah. Now I'm at a stage where we need to specialize. So that's why I called it a weakness. Like, and now I'm looking at, okay, so maybe sales I'm good at, but not that very good at that's not my natural thing i would rather be a marketer uh-huh. or maybe a, a technologist who's doing an architect so i'm now trying to specialize it i'll mm-hmm. say so so we do need help is what i definitely say i mean so i'm now trying to specialize even each of the role including my role it's like okay i should not be the bottleneck because when you do when i said all these three things that's also indicative that uh, all these three things if they should not go through me meaning mm-hmm. then i become the bottleneck so that's something that as you grow uh, one of the big focus is that i should not be bottleneck in any function and yeah uh, people are and there are processes and the biggest thing of fear which a a founder has is that uh, when you transition to somebody to run that function you may always think man they're not going to run with that much hundred percent i mean the founder's blood is different right it's like a blue whatever so the thing is that's always the thing but then you have to learn to let go which is what i'm going yeah it's it's one of the hardest things to do it's it's you you have to have that real trust you know and and yeah and the, the, just the ability to let go of something. And, and this is actually, I'll ask this question too in a little bit, but um, I guess I'll just ask it now, but essentially, you know, how, how important or not important is it uh, to, to become emotionally attached to a company? Yeah. So I think I, I actually read a lot of philosophy um, so I'm actually, I mean, I don't want to kind of talk about, so we do talk about what is uh, Advait Vedanta philosophy, which I follow there. The huge thing is around not being attached. It's like, you should do it as if it's part of your kind of, so you should do it with full hundred percent, but not be attached to it. And so it's uh-huh. something that's very hard, but I too try to practice. And that mm-hmm. actually kind of ties in very well to what you said, because if you are so attached, then maybe you won't let go Absolutely. because I do realize unless I kind of have somebody uh, build this function, they grow into it and they will make mistakes. Maybe initially they're only 60% of certain things. Like I tell you one example, I tell to my sales folk, you know what, when I get on a call, on a sales call, I close at 80%. And, then I, <laughs> and, and I'm like, and I know they can't because there is a difference being a founder, even just that name, I mean, gives you that benefit, right? Uh-huh, and yeah. so, so I can't have that expectation. So I got a level set, but I do know that's really needed for scale. I mean, otherwise I'll be the bottom like and i really will go crazy i mean so 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 two things one is the the big point you brought which is like build it but not be so emotionally attached just take a step back uh-huh. look at it you know in a different way that gives you a neutral perspective that's really does. very that's a huge thing okay but it's very hard to practice easier said but to do right. it is very hard which is what mm-hmm. i try to do I'm trying still i'm saying and then the other is how do you build because you have to recognize you will be the bottleneck if you don't have processes and people mm-hmm. who are taking because i really want to spend a lot of time thinking about large for example strategic partnerships because if i'm doing just that one sale that is great i got that at 80 percent that's fine but guess what what if i was able to strike a partnership which got me maybe thousand sites all at once of 5,000 and there are those partnerships out there uh-huh. right and so that's something that I want to kind of get out and get to the next level otherwise you're just contributing at you know uh, maybe mm-hmm. a uh, lower level so that's kind of uh, the one that I'm working on so great 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 answer that was great and uh, so now let's let's switch it around to the other you know the other um, point of it so what's one that's one thing uh, on push engage specifically that you're very proud of and don't, you know, you can brag whatever you want. Don't feel like you can't. <laughs> <laughs> sure. No, so I think, so I think the scale is one is what I'll say. And then we have some pretty large customers who use us. Uh, uh, I mean, in India, we have Reliance Ajio. Reliance Ajio is probably Geo was the number one telecom network. Ajio is their e-commerce. Mm-hmm. So we have some pretty large customers in the U.S. We have Indeed.com. We have Harvard Business Review in Taiwan. Uh, I think uh, what I'm proud of is that a lot of our customers came inbound and they were pretty large uh-huh. and i think that just shows that we were able to build some kind of a brand or we have built some kind of a brand that people even in very large companies when they're looking for web posts yeah. they come to us that's and then of course the scale so that's what i'm proud of but there is still a lot of work that to be done so yes yeah. <laughs> good good yeah, and you should be proud of the work that you you know you created a wonderful company sure. uh you, there's solutions you're helping people make more money uh, a lot of different things. So it's, it's definitely, you know, and then 
sometimes people want to be humble and things like that. But I think there's always a, a place for everything, sure. right? Um, no, um, absolutely. No, I'm very proud that these guys are very happy. So that's another point you brought. See, one of the other things which I love is when my new customer goes live and there is one uh, Fortune 50 which just went live in the US. I won't name it. But within 10 days, they were so happy because this is what I see because most people don't have so high expectation or they think, oh, uh, it's just a, a marketing speak that when we say that the yeah. ROI is so much better and the conversion as well as, you know, the subscription rate. See, one of the things we see is the subscription in push can be 10% versus email mm -hmm. as two. So you're seeing 5x. So most of them in the first month, they are really wowed because their uh -huh. subscribers will grow like crazy. And then when they'll send one or two pushes, mm -hmm. you know, uh, it's so funny that they'll have so much traffic. In fact, it's so funny. There's a super large travel site in Europe. Okay. I won't name them again. They're probably the, uh, they're the largest. They had issues with handling the load. They, they were sending push to a million sub subscribers. And we were generating so many concurrent sessions in the first three minutes after that push that the servers are having issues. So they asked us, can you please send it slow? So that was probably the biggest one for us. It's okay, okay. We are able to bring so much traffic to them yeah. that they are kind of crashing. So, and they are like the largest travel. So that's probably maybe the biggest one for us. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That's great. Um, no, I actually, you know, it's definitely one of the best feelings when, when you're doing something and and the client, right, your customer, or whatever you want to call them, they tell you like you need to stop, like you need to slow down because you're doing such a good yeah. job, um, yeah. right? So it's 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 it's, it's kind of like a double edged sword. Obviously, it's not that good, but it's it's. I mean, it's a good thing. It's great. Uh, to Correct. Have yeah. Problem. So so many so many uh, visitors for them. Yeah, they probably never expected is what it shows. Like they thought hey, it's going to maybe drive only few. So that's the uh -huh. thing. So yeah, that's awesome. And uh, let's see. And and when it comes to, to actual marketing tactics and things like that, and it sounds like you have a pretty s strong grasp on, on marketing and advertising and, and, you know, those kinds of strategies, what's been one of the most successful things. And you, you mentioned that a lot of the people that came in uh, at the beginning and maybe even still now was through inbound. Um, sure. other, other than inbound, what are some of the things that you've done um, or the team has done that have been really successful um, whether it's one of those growth hacks that you mentioned earlier or, or just, you know, sure. the thing that really you said, okay, well, this is definitely working. Yeah, no, absolutely. So I will say, so in fact, I have a slide deck out there in the slide chair uh, talking about how we got our zero to hundred customers. It talks about all the tactics we use, people want, they can look it up. Mm -hmm. I've done actually a couple of talks on that in the last few months. So few things at the top of my head, they're still inbound. I would say in terms of the salesperson, I am probably the only outbound salesperson and then I opportunistically, you know, pick and call. So we still are not in outbound mode. We're still doing 100% or 99% inbound, mm -hmm. just making that. So within inbound also, there are many things that has worked well. So the first one is the powered by, the powered by push engage that shows up when you are, let's say on a free plan has really worked very well for us. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that has worked well, for example, in referral is let's say you are, uh, customer X and you implemented push engage and you send out a push it goes out to everybody people are observing the UTM variables and they are able to make out who's powering it so actually that has been our biggest word of mouth if you may because people now know hey this big site is now using push engage and their competitors may be smaller or same site they are saying hey what's that tool let's check it out so that's been the number one that's always worked very well is what I want to say and that's no different than the email world in some sense email marketing companies also had the powered by in the uh, in the full oh, right yeah, so it's definitely yeah, one of the growth hacks that's out yeah. there that's been very successful for most people i would say um, yeah absolutely and then use it as much so that's first the second has been uh, we do try to write in marketing you know places so so we're trying to figure out who's our audience if it's the the person who is the e-commerce affiliate manager or the marketing manager then we're trying to figure out where do these people hang and see if we can write enough content we don't try to sell too much but we try to do some first uh, i would say um, primary research for example we did research just recently and published this comparison between let's say you did art amendment how would it do in email versus web push there isn't there are tons of studies for email and so we just aggregated them and saw the aggregate results but on web push we have so many ourselves and then we compared the case studies. nobody has done this for example although this seems very intuitive uh -huh. and that's something that was a very big hit and and it's still working for us is because now we are telling you very clear data 
with data. So we go with data. We do a lot of data driven, you know, case studies that have actually worked well. So those are the two ones that have worked. And then of course, writing ongoing content. But having said that, it's not easy to generate a content that either gets viral or that's, you know, liked by a lot of people. And, and again, we do a bit of advertising as well, uh, because you always have to do some of it to kind of drive some relevant traffic. But by no means we have cracked any of the other channels. I still think we have a way to go both in SEO, in paid. I mean, we can spend a lot more is now I feel uh -huh. uh, given where we are, but, but it's still a lot of stuff we have to do better at. But the first two was the big ones for us. You know, That's awesome. Sense. That sounds like like a lot of learning, right? Uh, yes, a lot about time and just understanding how everything works, you know, what's working for us. Uh, sure. And one of the things that I talked about before too with people is, is understanding, you know, some of the things that big players are doing. Um, so just, you know, repeating successful actions and there's usually no need to reinvent the wheel. Uh, someone yeah. already, someone, you know, I don't care who you are. Someone's already thought of something before, before you, uh, done something else. And when you look at, you know, SaaS company specifically, there's a lot of big players already that's, yeah. that we're doing this for a long time. And if you kind of, you know, do what you did, which, you know, you kind of reverse engineered where you ended up. Uh, if yeah. you do that with everything that they're doing, you can figure out what's been working for them or what's, what's not working by seeing what they're not doing, um, that you maybe thought of trying out and things like that. Um, but I think it's a, it's a mix of understanding what's been done so far that has worked, um, you know, with specific industries or really, um, uh, business models that are similar, um, or understanding, you know, or trying new things too. I mean, obviously there, there, there is new things to try and, and obviously, you know, push engage is one of them for many people, yeah. right? This is extremely new and it's not something that's been out there for a long time. And it sounds like the results that people are getting from a product like yours are pretty much astronomical. Um, yeah. and then they don't even realize that they could be getting something that big from just a notification on their browser. Um, yeah. so I think that's awesome. And, and, we're kind of getting close to the, to the 30 minutes here. So I do want to wrap up, but I want to ask a couple more questions. And one of them is going to be actually, what is your favorite book? And actually sure. you, you mentioned, you know, reading a little bit more about philosophy and things like that. So I, why don't you give me two books? Give me one book on philosophy and then give me one book on more like a business uh, focus. Sure. So, so I would say zero to one is something uh, which is uh, kind of my favorite on, I guess, um, the, from a business perspective. Again, on the philosophy, it'll be a little hard. I, I do uh, read some very, uh, I would say, fundamental uh, uh -huh. philosophy, which is probably more maybe what we call it the self-realization, but I would kind of maybe give a high level. There is a book called Flow by Mike Krzyzewski. Uh, he talks about what makes us happy. Uh, and also what gets us engaged. That's probably more fundamental uh -huh. a book uh, on consciousness study. Uh, uh -huh. So that's, that's something. And then there's one marshmallow experiment that you should Google and look up. That's been fundamental around what makes you successful. So those are some few tips I would. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. So, so I actually, not recently, I forgot exactly when I started, you know, like meditating daily and things like that. And I was listening to one podcast. I forgot who it was, but he talks about flow. Um, and getting into flow and things like that. And I yeah. mean, maybe that's what the book talks about, but it sounds definitely interesting. Yeah, no, that's, that's a fundamental book. It talks about what makes us engrossed in something. And, and I think that that book is kind of fundamental for people who are kind of uh, on the business world and kind of maybe looking at, you know, uh, I, I do read some very core, uh, you know, spiritual stuff, which mm -hmm. I'll just leave it saying, you know, uh, realizing who I am. So for example, I'm reading right now, Raman Maharshi's, you know, um, okay. uh, self realization so again that's just too hard uh, like a hardcore <laughs> stuff so i don't want to bring it but but that's kind of at the borderline you can yeah. start thinking what what makes you happy and you know awesome. so that's what some of the trade-offs i made i have always not been around you know not maximizing you uh -huh. know the cash flow but maybe the happiness no yeah i mean absolutely right it's it's nothing i don't I, no matter how much money you're making if you're not happy right. then you're just not happy and 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 yeah. you know it's it's not it's not they don't say that happy that money doesn't buy happiness just because it's it's you know just because to say it because it's true. I mean, if if if, if you're not happy, you can be making billions and, and trillions of dollars, and you're just gonna be yeah. sitting there with a bunch of cash without anything to do and like no one to, no one to I don't know just you know. So it definitely being happy is it should be a priority 
no matter yep. what it is you're doing. And that's why I tell people that are on this podcast and most of them understand, you know, you, you have to be passionate about what you do and it, and maybe not necessarily the, the product itself, but I think that it comes hand in hand, right? So you, you, you're creating a product and maybe that's not essentially what makes you happy, but what makes you happy is what's doing for other people. So in your case, it could be, you know, essentially it's growing someone's business, right? When, when you're sure. dealing with an e-commerce site, maybe it doesn't look like the, the, the most, you know, I don't, I don't know what the right word is. Um, but it doesn't look like anything too fancy, I guess, if you want to call it. Sure. Um, but when you think about it from like a 30 foot thousand, you know, a, a 30,000 foot view, you realize that a product like push engage could potentially be building someone else's business that is then going to feed a lot of different mouths, right. And, and give yeah. a, a, a job to a lot of people. And yeah. um, maybe their product, you know, is something else that essentially is going to make someone else's life easier and things like that. So there's a lot of different ways to look at things, but essentially what I guess what my point is that if you're not happy, then there's no point to even do anything. Um, Absolutely. So. And I think your point about giving jobs, it's such a huge, I was mean, actually surprised that uh, we were creating jobs because people were saying my job in the company is to send web push notifications. Yeah. And in their resume, they were writing, okay, specialized in push engage. I was so <laughs> happy to see some resumes when I saw people apply that uh -huh. they're already listing our tool. And I was so happy that people are. So that's a huge point. And then I think the big one is for us, the big one is that you're helping the company grow revenue, which means helping them grow. That's Absolutely. definitely a fundamental one. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I think that's, that's all. Um, do you have any questions for me, Ravi? No, I'm good. I think this was real good. And I, I know I didn't talk much about the product, uh, but I mean, again, just to kind of put in a 30 second, uh, we should, you know, if you are a website owner looking to increase your traffic by re-engaging your customers, you should check out Push Engage and that's what I would say to all of our, you know, our listeners. Absolutely. Check out Push Engage. Like I said, there, uh, Ravi was able to give us a discount. Extremely appreciative for doing that. So uh, if you're an e-com or, or any other type of online business that has, you know, a, a website and essentially you're putting content out or deals and things like that, check it out. Um, I've been and, and looked at some of the stuff that you've been doing so far and it looks like you're able to get some really, really good results with it. Uh, whether that's, you know, traffic and people coming back people shopping and things like that. So definitely check it out. Um, and uh, thank you for being on the interview today, Ravi. It was a pleasure speaking with you and, and getting to know a little bit more about your background, about yourself and the company and, you know, everything that it takes to build a successful company like Push Engage. So um, again, I really appreciate you taking the time out, out of your morning um, because it's yeah. super early for you. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for having me. It was really pl a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. And where can people find you online, whether it's LinkedIn or, or what, it's Facebook? Yes. Yeah. So it's Twitter, uh, Trivedi Ravi or LinkedIn. I'm accessible there as well as Facebook. So if you just awesome. search my name with Push Engage, you'll find me, Ravi Push Engage. There you go. So just look up Ravi Push Engage. We'll be able to find him if you have any questions about the product. Uh, make sure to ask him. He is the expert. He knows everything about it. And uh, <laughs> you're still learning and, and you can always email if you become my customer yeah. after listening to this podcast, I promise I'll get on a call and help you with your marketing. He's practice. got 80% 80, 80 close rate. So if you get on a phone call, there's a pretty high chance you're going to be close. <laughs> and uh, give so, away my secret. Okay. So. Uh, absolutely. No, no, I, I'll, I'll get on the call. Okay. I'll really help you. Okay. Yeah. See, so he'll, he'll help you out. So uh, you can find me at pretty much Instagram is really the only place I'm really active. And that's going to be C-A-M-A-C-H-O dot F-T-M. And also the agency is phantom dot agency uh, spelled with an F. So make sure to follow those and keep up with what we're doing. And uh, again, thank you so much, Ravi, for being on here today. And I really appreciate the time. And if you're a SaaS founder, entrepreneur, CEO, uh, make sure you join the SaaS Ad Lab group. Uh, that's pretty much where we do everything for the podcast, share you know information about advertising and things like that for your company. Um, so make sure you do that. And if you want to be on the podcast, let me know. We'll be very, very glad to have you on here. And uh, with that being said, I challenge every single one of you to go out and do something that's going to impact your life for the positive. And uh, thank you, Ravi, for being on here today. And uh, I'll you. talk to you soon. Thanks so much. Thanks. Bye-bye.